Good morning, everyone. Um, so annual HP seminar, I think we've been doing this for, oh, I've been doing it at least for 20 years now. Um, and uh, I'm joined by, I'm Matthew Lee of Todd Chan Lee, and uh, Mark Cacchini's here. And uh, he runs, uh, he's an attorney as well, and he runs Antioch Associates. And his contact information is on the last slide. Uh, so for all of you, I'm fine, and those attending online, uh, that more than happy to send out the PowerPoint to that. Um, but I just ask that you don't share the PowerPoint with others that are here. Is it's really PowerPoint's really notes for the speaker, not for the <laughs> for the audience. And, and I don't want some of the some of the notes to be uh, misinterpreted uh, just because they see it in my name. Okay, so um, I've been doing this for this is my I think twenty going into my 25th season. My season is pretty close to about 20 years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we, uh, we've seen pretty much everything in the H2B world. Um, and, and we're here to share uh, share our experience and the process with all of you. Um, just real quick, uh, who has done the H2B process before, at least in the world? Two, all right, so a lot of newbies. Um, anyone online, uh, everyone online, are they pretty much uh, new to the program as well. First time. Oh, oh first time. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I I always start off, and, and I, I don't know if it's the right analogy, uh, especially with opiate epidemic all over the place, but the HDB program is like crack. Okay. It's really good when it works, um, from what I hear, um, and it'll keep you going. It'll keep your, your, your business alive, but there will be a time where it's going to kill you, okay? It's going to kill your business because you're relying so much on it. So I suggest to all of you only to use the HTP program if you absolutely have no other option and you have to, okay? And then the second thing is if you're going to use the HTP program, rely on finding in-country folks. Just try to find uh, just try to find other country folks and rely on the H to B cap. Um, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Okay, and we'll talk about what cap and cap exempt folks mean. Um, but if you're going to jump into this process, and, and we've got, I've got the same client there, you know, I've had four clients for 20 years, right? And uh, every year is an adventure. Some years it really hurts, um, and it hurts them. In other years, it better and works smoothly. Um, so. So if I seem discouraging, um, it's because I am, uh, because I don't want you to do something and rely on these folks showing up and, that it, and they don't show up, because then you're even in the worst situation. Okay, next slide. The process was changed in 2019, and it hasn't changed that much since. Um, a few little tweaks here and there in the last couple of years, but from uh, last year to this year, I don't see, I didn't see anything that's changing. Um, did you? There was one that was a very good benefit, which was um, we'll get into it on the extensions, but the extensions were allowed to work even though the uh, application was pending. Right, but I thought I believe that was just for the summer. I thought that ended on, on October 31st. Mm -hmm. oh, it was part of the summer, that one, right? Yeah. That, that was only a temporary one. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's jump into it. So last year, to give you an idea, so there's a cap, all right? So an H2B cap is um, 66,000 visas are issued every federal fiscal year. So that started October 1st. Um, every federal fiscal year, 66,000 H2Bs are issued. This cap is for people that are not currently in H2B status. So the majority of these folks are folks that are that are, let's just say Jamaicans, they're sitting in Jamaica, they're not in h to they were not in h to status in the US, they left the country or they've never been here in h to status, they're sitting outside and an employer that wants to sponsor them will apply for them to get one of these 66,000 so they can come in during the federal fiscal year. Federal fiscal year started uh, October 1st, 22, and will end September 30th of next 2023. It used to be that all 66,000 visas were issued on October 1st. So what happened was that during this, the, um, all the winter <coughs> resorts would end up with the first shot at getting these visas because their date of need is November or December. Um, so they would apply ahead of all the summer resort people during the same fiscal year. 
So um, when I was here at the chamber, um, we and Congressman Keating's office were able to um, start moving to change that law, which then split to the 66,000 into two caps. So 33,000 is released on October 1st and 33,000 are released on April 1st of next year. So that way, the next summer seasonal businesses have a chance at that 66,000 cap, okay? So the, um, the, so there's 33,000 set for October 1st and 33,000 for April 1st. Give you an idea of what you're up against. If you're trying to capture one of these cap numbers so you can sponsor an H2B that's sitting outside the country or who's, they're not currently in H1B, H2B status. I apologize if I keep saying H1B, that's the majority of my business with you for professional workers. Um, I, I, <laughs> so, uh, but I mean h to b okay? Um, so last year, you're not allowed to file your application with the US Department of Labor to start off the, the second phase of this process more than 90 days before your first day of need. So most people have a start of April 1st, okay? And that's, um, April 1st is when that first, that second 33,000 pieces are released. So the earliest you can file is January 1st. All right, so if you have a need for April 1st next year, you're allowed to file on January 1st. Last year, the US Department of Labor received 7,800 applications for 136,000 positions. So on each application, you can ask for 20 um, housekeepers or, or 20 dishwashers or 20 cooks, all right? So there were 7,800, 7,875 applications for 136,000 spots, all right? So you can do the math. There's only 33,000 released, all right? So this has been pretty typical the last, um, even right before COVID, uh, this has been pretty typical for the last five or six years. So they started this new process last year. Uh, uh, this is our going into our third year for the randomization. Um, so this year is the third year of um, what's called randomization. Okay, so what they do is they're going to get the bulk of those April 1st applications on, April, on January 1st. So those 7,800 applications last year that were received between January 1st and January 3rd, they go into um, essentially a lottery at Department of Labor. And what they do is they assign a group number. Okay, so the group A are the first 33,000 applications that are that are picked basically out of the water. Okay, so out of that 7,800 um, applications filed, they'll pick um, and they'll give Group A to those applications that will fill out the first 33,000. Then there's Group B, which is uh, the next. I think we're going about 10,000, 20,000. Group B is 20,000. Group C is 20,000. Group and it went all the way to E. F, <laughs> all the way to F last year. So if you're not assigned when you file your application or your attorneys or your agent files their application on January 1st, you'll know by January 15th at the latest when what group assignments your occupations were assigned. If you're not granted a group A, then the chances of you getting one of these 33,000 is slim enough. Okay. However, doesn't mean the process is over for you. If you can find those individuals that are in the US in H2B status that were previously counted in another cap, so they were counted during the fall cap or in the previous three years, they're allowed to stay in work and they don't have to get another cap number. All right, let me say that again. So for the worker, if the worker is brought in under the cap, they're allowed to stay in the US continuously in H2B status for up to three years. And they don't have to, the employer that hires them does not have to capture another capital respect. So Killington Resort applies in the fall cap of the 33,000. They get one of these folks, they come in. They can then go from Killington to um, Ocean Edge, to Killington to Ocean Edge, and they can do that for up to three years. When they go from Killington to Ocean Edge, Ocean Edge does not need to get one of these cap numbers because they're cap exempt. That worker is not counted against the cap for up to three years. Okay. So those are the people that I'm telling all of you, advising all of you, 
to search after. Because getting one of those 33,000 cap numbers on April 1st is, is it's less than, less than, you know, 15% chance of doing that. Okay. One other, one other point on that. Um, if someone did come in um, for killing them in the winter and could not find an extension job and did have to go home and did go back to their homeland and now in their homeland, they wanted to come back to the United States to work. Um, they are what we call cap exempt also because they have already been counted in the first 33,000 against the, the cap. Year. So you can reach, if, there are not that many that return home with the expectation or the intention of coming back. But if you can find those workers in their homeland and they did come in the first half, they are exempt from the, uh, being counted, double counted. Right. So, because the federal fiscal year is again from October first to the next September, right? So it's just a, it's just the way the federal fiscal year works. So if you're counted last fall, like he said, for Kellington, that person's cap exempt for the whole year. So you could bring them in. Okay. Um, that's the difference between a cap exempt employee and a cap subject employee. Cap subject employee means you have to be Group A and get one of these. 33,000 spots, all right? And the chances are very, very, very short that you're going to get it. Um, last year in our office was probably the luckiest we ever got. Um, we filed 40 applications and half of them were group A. But the year before we filed 40 applications, I think three were group A. How, what did you guys? We had um, uh, half of, we had 48% batting average if you want. Good. Of group A's and B's, yep. and of the and, and just a, a caveat, um, we had one, maybe two that were in group B that got put into group B that didn't get in. That in other words, that all of our A's and all of our B's except one or two were got in under the cap, which was really good. So if you do get into a B, you still have a shot because if if somebody that got into group A. And Matt will go over, we'll go over the timelines. If they didn't hit the timelines and get their approvals in time and do the paperwork timely, um, anyone in Group B can <laughs> potentially group over, jump over chance, Group A. But, it, but, but it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not usual. It's not usual. Um, and the reason for it is that Department of Labor is where we start off the process. And we're going to go into this in a minute. Um, but they don't control the cap. USCIS <laughs> controls the cap. Uh, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services and USCIS is um, uh, they keep count of those thirty-three thousand. So as they approve the H two B application, they're counting how many are cap subject and they're counting that thirty-three thousand. So they will literally at any time say cap's been met. We're not accepting any more cap subject employees um, for your application. All right. Last year that was. They reached the entire cap on February 25th of last year. Okay. So, uh, again, you can't start the process with the Department of Labor until January 1. And you, and you have to go through that whole process of proving you can't find a US worker. Then you file with USCIS, and USCIS controls the cap on February 25th. They ran out. That's why this group randomization process is actually beneficial for employers because it helps you. Uh, direct your resources to the right type of worker that you're looking for, right? Instead of trying to deal with agents and find people outside the country, knowing that you're most likely not going to get one of those cap subject folks, you're going to get a cap exempt folk, concentrate your efforts on in country transfers that have part of that three years left to come work for you. All right, is everyone on the same page when it comes to that? All right, terrific. Uh, last year, there were some, all right, so let's just move fast forward and, and let's say you've got all your visas and, and your people were approved. That still didn't mean they came in on time, okay? So you have, you, you, you found the January 1st, you get um, January 1st uh, approval, I mean, Group A approval. Then you go through, you file with USCIS, you get a cap number and your four uh, housekeepers from Bulgaria are approved for the U.S. Embassy in Sofia, Bulgaria, so they have to make an appointment going to the embassy, pick up their visas, be interviewed, and they come in, okay? Um, during COVID, the U.S. Embassies were closed, 
Okay, so the problem was even though you had a Putin in your hand and you gave it to your workers, they couldn't go to an embassy to get a visa, so they couldn't come into the US. This past year was a lot better, but there was there's significant delays at US embassies across the world. All right. So just because we've gotten you through the to the last stage of the process, understand that they still have to go to a US embassy and consulate and they have to come in um, and get their visas. All right. And getting a visa appointment is not easy. I, I know for professional workers in India, they're giving appointment dates now for 2024. Okay. So um, <coughs> and you've spent all this money to get them, you know, all the legal fees and expenses to get them the visas, everything's approved, and then they can't get the visa appointment. So that's yet another um, um, kind of a negative factor of this whole process. Um, it's getting better. I don't know how quickly the, um, the, the, the visa delays um, are going to uh, uh, quicken up. We talked about cap exempts, and that's why I got a smiley face. Oh, thanks for that. And then um, in a sad face, went to cap exempt. All right, our cap subject. All right, so here's some strategies that you can employ to try to capture these caps. Let's say the three workers you want, really the, the most critical workers you want are outside the country and you need to get one of those 33,000 cap numbers. One way to do it is if you can prove that your season is split, meaning that you have a significant difference between um, two parts of your season, meaning April 1st to um, August 1st is the bulk but you still have a seasonal need through November. Okay, so if you have a 30 day, I'd say, I'd roughly say about 30 days. So if you can, you can split your application up, which gives you two chances at the cap, right? So if you have a need for 50 dishwashers and you say, I need 25 from April 1st to November 1st, and then I need another 25 um, from April 1st to September 30th, you can file two applications giving you two chances at the cap, okay? However, the Department of Labor is kind of getting kind of, kind of uh, uh, wary to this type of strategy, and they'll come back and they'll fight you on it. All right. That's why you have to make those two seasons significantly um, different and be able to support it with evidence that shows that you have an entire need of 50, but there's distinctly uh, a period of time where you lay off and you send home um, half of them. Um, and that, that that distinction is at least 30 days is what this is, is what I uh, <laughs> okay, so that's one strategy. Another one, um, but again, it's going to cost you more, right? So you're duplicating all your filing fees and your legal fees by splitting up one application for 50 dishwashers into two applications for 25 dishwashers for two different periods of time. All right. Second strategy is let's say your dishwashers get group A assignment, so you get a chance at the cap, but your cooks. And your housekeepers were all group C and D, so there's no chance you're going to get them in under the cap. But there's three dish, uh, there's three um, um, there are cooks and and housekeepers that you really want. You can bring them in under the cap as a dishwasher, but they have to work at least one pay period. I mean, they need to do that job, okay, for at least a pay period. Then you can file an application for them to go on to the other. Um, application and change them over, okay, to to the position that you really want them to work for summer. Again, we, we did that in limited cases for some of our clients that really had two or three people that they that they just they wanted back and they needed to be in this other position, but they were outside the country. They were subject to the cap, or they've already used it three years. So they have to leave. Um, but again, this is going to cost you a lot of money, right? So you know, my clients come back at the end of the year and they say, "Wow, why was my bill so high?" And I said, well, because you wanted Frank to, and we, you know, because they had so many individual requests and during the heat of the moment in April and May when they're panicking, they say, just do it, just do it, just do it. And then they get the bill, all right? Um, so that's the biggest problem. What's a pay period? What's that? What's a pay period? It's uh, a pay period. You have to pay them in no less than um, uh, two weeks, I think. Yeah, well, yeah. But your pay period is defined by your company, but it has to be a defined period. So it could be Monday morning at 12 a.m. until, um, uh, you know, 11.59 uh, on Sunday. Okay. Right. And that's most of our business. And it has to be um, the 35 or 40 hours during a seven-day period of time. So you can't stretch out more than a week. can't be less. You can't put 40 hours in. 
Can I just comment on that? Sure. That thing? Um, on those two alternative um, strategies, um, I think the most important thing is kind of the cost benefit analysis and the risk that, that I'm outlining that. I, I don't usually employ that in terms of the splitting, and I and I don't usually have them necessarily change uh, a job title once they've been brought in. The reality is, if, especially in culinary and that type of thing, you know, if they're a food prep, they might you know pitch in and help it out to do dishwashing once in a while or whatever. Um, but I, I wouldn't take a somebody that came in on a food prep and definitively put them in the dishwashing position or someone that came in in dishwashing and definitively put them in line cooks position, certainly um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, your payroll, it's going to affect your payroll numbers next year. So when you we go through and show the information that you have to supply to support your need, your payroll numbers are going to be skewed if you have your line cook working in the dishwasher's position or vice versa. And so when you go to prove your need the following year, that really is, is going to be a problem. Second is um, uh, the worker himself or herself might report, um, I was brought in as a line cook. Um, I'm not working as a line cook. They got me doing dishes or... Uh, well, that's why you have to file the application. Right. Right. Um, so it, it's really uh, my suggestion to my clients is really put the person in the position for the job titles that you really want that to work in. Um, and even if it's multiple position, if it's multiple positions, you can try and use it. But if you get challenged on the payroll, they say, well, you know, John Smith was here. We've got him in this payroll. We've got him in that payroll. But they usually don't go in that detail. I, there is some risk, that's all. Yeah, and, and, and the only ones that really split um, are the really the larger resorts and the, and the larger employees that are bringing in over, over 30 people in a particular occupation. So it's not, you know, uh, if your need is 10, 10 housekeepers and five cooks, it's not really going to work for you, all right? It's, it's um, you know, the, the, the larger resorts that bring in 50 dishwashers and 50 cooks, um, and they need two cooks really on that, application to bring them in as a dishwasher they can work as a dishwasher at least for one pay period and then switch them over so it doesn't affect um, the payroll reports or the seasonality for that position all right so next slide is just some um really quick uh acronyms that we're going to be uh shorthand for the um shorthand for the presentation uh co certifying officer that's basically the department of labor uscis uh, National Processing Center, wage an hour. Let's see here. U.S. worker is U.S. citizens, lawful permanent residents, refugees, and salaries others permitted to work, includes J1s. And I'll explain why. Workers in corresponding employment, uh, first day of UC, 1DN, first day of B. That's your first day of C only. Okay. The temporary labor certification is for 9142B. And the squad is a state workforce agency. In this case, it's Massachusetts Employment um, uh, Labor and Workforce Development Office. All right. So, what's the H2B program? It is a program that allows you to bring in people if you uh, bring in folks in specific occupations, if you can prove that you have a temporary non agricultural need for that occupation. It's not necessarily your business, it's that occupation. Okay. Seasonal, what's a seasonal need? So that's a business that literally opens and closes its doors every year or has absolutely no need for that occupation at other times of the year. Okay, so if you're in uh, Four Seas Ice Cream here in Centerville, they literally close their doors in November, they don't reopen again to April, they are a seasonal business. Okay, um, uh, Landscape. landscapers, okay, uh, same thing. Right, so they, they literally don't have a, a landscape we need. That landscaping company may be um, uh, may operate all year round, and they'll do um, they'll do snow plowing in the winter. But they literally have no need for landscapers between uh, whatever fall thing up that's November or April of next year. Okay, peak load need is a business. 
that has a year round need for that occupation, but it peaks during certain periods of time, right? So that would be, um, uh, what's the, what's the, what, the, the hotel right off the street here? Uh, yeah, the carpet center, right? So they're open year round um, and they have a, uh, they have needs for, uh, for housekeepers all year round, but obviously their housekeeper uh, need drops significantly during the winter months. Um, they may only have two housekeepers on staff during the winter months, but then back in the summer, they have up to 50. So that's a business that's open year round, that occupation is being used year round, but they obviously have a peak need. Okay, and our peak need is normally um, tied to the season. So it gets a little bit confusing there. Intermittent, you're not going to see this a whole lot. Um, intermittent is occasional irregular need. That's uh, the best uh, example that I give uh, that, that I can find. It's actually the property website, it would be like a software company. And they have a new edition of the software coming out, and they need it all translated into a hundred different languages that it's going to be sold at, right? So that's there's no predictable pattern to that. But once every three years for about six months, they need translators. Okay, so that's an intermittent need. In a one-time occurrence, we won't. Well, we I guess I guess remember that crazy wedding two summers ago out in um, out in uh, CBI in Quonset. Um, the $9 million wedding uh, by the Motorola executive. Um, they had a one-time need, right? I don't know how often they have $9 million weddings out there. Um, and they have people brought in uh, just for that. So I guess that would be a one-time need. Now there would be like if the Olympics were coming to, to the king and we would have a one-time need for that. And, you, and in those cases, you can actually ask for something for up to three years. Um, my 25 years, we've never had a one-time need on the okay, or anywhere else. All right, next slide should be up to six. Employers can hire foreign workers. So you can use the H2B program if you prove that you have a temporary seasonal need or peak load need. And if you can prove you cannot find qualified US workers, okay? And you also have to make sure that there's no adverse effect to the US workers that you have currently. You have to have a US federal employer identification number you have to have a physical business. It cannot be for agricultural work, all right? So I do get phone calls every, every summer from the various uh, small farms here on the Cape. It's not for those positions. And in groundskeeping <coughs> and uh, landscaping, uh, groundskeeping and golf courses, uh, landscaping is not considered true agricultural work. I'm not sure why, but it's, it's exempt for the h 2 b process. All right, so they 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 can be um, uh, used in the H2B. They can use the H2B process. It has to be for full time employment, so that's no less than thirty five hours a week. So H two B program is not for twenty hour a week positions. Okay, no more than you cannot ask for nor uh, more than nine month or a nine month period. Okay, so you can't ask for people to come in March first until December first. Right. Um, it has to be limited within nine months. Um, it says a one-time extension. Uh, is, extensions are possible. They're not possible. Right? For all practical purposes, you can't extend. So, you know, come, um, come June or come August, you call our office and say, listen, we just booked three more weddings for November and our, uh, our, our, our cooks have to leave in October. Trying to get that process through the Department of Labor and USCIS um, in August, it'd be impossible. So it's, it's pretty much impractical. All right, application. You need an application for every single job opportunity and every single period that you need it for, okay? Um, so you can't have a single uh, one application for a hybrid housekeeper, dishwasher, cook. okay? You can, but it's gonna create a million other problems for you that we're gonna talk about. So if you, there's no reason why you can't file for your housekeepers, 10 housekeepers, 10 dishwashers, and 10 cooks. Okay, you can have three different applications, but they all have to be individual applications, right? Further, if you have a distinct two seasons, okay? So like I said before, <clears throat> we just split. So if you say, listen, I need, uh, I'm a seasonal business, I only open April to November. I need um, two cooks for the entire season. But I would need 10 cooks from June 1st to September uh, 1st. 
then you could file and you should file that case, uh, maybe two applications, okay, and split your folks up, all right? But if you generally get away with a single application and say you need 10 for the whole season, that'll encompass the, 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 the two people that you need in April and the two people you need in October, okay? It's not the greatest way to do it, but it, it, it can work. Um, and multiple work sites need to be disclosed. Okay, so if you're a landscaping company and um, you do work here on Cape Cod, but you also do it up in um, uh, Bridgewater and Raynham and uh, uh, what's, uh, Carver, and, you, and, you, and, your, and your workers need to go from the Cape and also up there, those are two um, MSASs, right? Metropolitan Statistical Area Subcategories. All right, so the, they have to determine what the prevailing wage is for you. You have to go through the prevailing wage process. So you may have two different prevailing wages. They will assign you the highest prevailing wage for the entire worker. So um, usually where that comes in is if it's a franchisee and the franchisee has multiple locations, yeah. Lean, Tyannis, Vaughn, whatever, um, you can file that one petition as long as you, you state those three different locations or four different locations where the franchises are, um, then they will assign you the highest prevailing wage for each of those, ge whichever the geographic locations are, because they don't know where you're going to put the workers. They don't know if you're going to have the workers in Vaughan, Hyannis, Orleans, whatever. So. Right. All right, so here's the process. Um, this is the overview. First is what's called H2B registration. So this is still not in effect. Um, however, all the information needed for H2B registration is, um, is, is kind of done throughout the process with the Department of Labor. So don't worry so much about the registration process. Again, that's part of the provision. Now this law, this regulation was passed in 2019. We still haven't implemented that part of the regulation. All right. Um, it takes almost 15 to 20 years for USCIS and Department of Labor to implement regulations, believe it or not. Um, all right, so the first thing you need to do is come up with a job description and for the occupations that you want to bring people in, and you have to file it, file that occupation um, with the U.S. Department of Labor on Form 9141, which is prevailing wage request. So that's where you have to describe the job. You have to um, describe where the work is going to be performed. All right, and all, um, and all, well, th those are the two primary things. All right. You don't need to know what time, you know, what the period is going to be yet. You don't have to talk about uh, necessarily the benefits that come with the job, but what are the job duties and where is it going to be performed is what U.S. Department of Labor wants. This prevailing wage form takes about 60 days to turn around. In our office, we have all of our uh, prevailing wages filed by October 1st, right? And, and I know that, that Mark uh, tries to do the same thing, <coughs> um, but they keep tr tr trickling. Yeah, I think by November. Yeah, we have we've submitted the first one September first this year. It just came in this week. Okay, well that's pretty so quick. Six weeks, right? But usually it will slow down. Yeah, usually it's <coughs> three, five, three, four, five. But this is this has been slow this year. Um, so we estimate sixty days, right? To be safe. Uh, once the prevailing wage comes back, that's what you're stuck with. Okay, that's what you have to pay your your H two Bs if they come in. And all other US workers that are performing the same job needs. Okay, so um, uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. All right, so then the prevailing wage comes back. And in the meantime, Mark's office or my office will be preparing um, the TLC, which is the labor certification form that we have to file on January 1st if you have an April 1st start date. So if you have an April 1st start date, you can't file earlier than 90 days. So that brings us to January 1st. Um, and we're preparing the, the regular, the larger application for the Department of Labor. And the, the temporary labor certification is on form 9142B, and there's an appendix B. Again, you can't file that form 90 days, more than 90 days before your first day of need, or any earlier than 75 days. All right, because what they want is they want a very distinct period of time where you've approved three US workers to prove you can't find a US worker. All right. All right. Um, this, when we when we kick off this process, we're also going to request um, the Massachusetts Department of Unemployment Insurance uh, Labor and Workforce Development Office to post the job on their um, unemployment website 
for uh, it's going to be up there for pretty much the entire spring, the late winter and spring. Um, just to, to, to funnel the US workers that might want that job to you, to you. All right, so then what happens is if you're group A, right, and you pick one of those, we found January 1st to 3rd, and you're, you're a group A person, uh, you're a group A occupation, then you're going to be the first ones picked up by Department of Labor, the first ones processed. Okay, so they'll issue what's called a notice of acceptance, which says, all right, activate the job order with the state, um, and uh, and we're going to uh, post the position in your office to find U.S. workers. And this is a, a two-week process, and you have to field all um, applications from U.S. workers. All right. And then you have to, at the end of that two-week process, you have to reply back and tell the Department of Labor that you have not found any U.S. workers, or you found two that are going to show up on in April, and they won't. Okay, um, a lot of the folks that, that apply for these jobs are they're doing what they have to do to get their unemployment uh, benefits from Massachusetts. So they'll go on the website and they'll say, Oh, yeah, I'll be a cook, you know, um, uh, on the for you. And then it's three months later, so they're not going to show up on April 1st. But it's the process we've got to prove you have to prove you can't find a U.S. worker. So all of stage one literally starts now. And if we're lucky and you've got a group A assignment, we have a labor certification by the end of January. Okay, so the process starts now. And if you're lucky, end of mid January, uh, mid February, um, the whole first stage of this process. Um, uh, uh, that's the duration of it. Once you have a approved temporary labor certification, 10 cooks for Hyannis from April 1st to October 30th, uh, 31st. Then you go to USCIS and you will apply for them to be issued a visa or a visa status if they're already in the US. Okay, that process you can request 15 day adjudication. You have to pay extra for that. That's an extra fifteen hundred dollars. But you can ask USCIS to approve that, uh, adjudicate that uh, that application fifteen days. And then the last stage is once you have that approval notice, if they're in the country, they can start working for you. If they're outside the country, they have to go to a U.S. embassy, their consulate, and make a visa appointment. We don't provide those services in our office. Do you guys provide consulate services? No. Yeah, well, we have an agent there. You have an agent, okay. Um, and, and we're going to talk about agents a little bit as well. They're, they're very helpful to you, and, and, and you really need one. Because <laughs> um, I'm a law firm. Well, we're a law firm. We're not an HR office, right? So we don't help shepherd folks to the embassy and make them appointments. We don't. Um, we just get the legal approval notices and then hand it off to the to the employer to go find uh, to to shepherd their people through the, the the travel arrangements of the embassy and the consulates. We give them all the paperwork they need. Okay, and I think as Mark was saying that they pretty much do the same. But you need somebody on the ground. So if you get 60, 20, uh, 20 folks from Jamaica, you need someone to coordinate the visa appointments and get them to the embassy with the right paperwork to get the visa so they can want it. Okay, or if they're all coming from Walt Disney World at the end of March, and you've got to coordinate, you know, uh, transportation for them to get here, um, and uh, and get them their approval notices and get them their notices and things like that. Again, we don't do that in our office. Most law firms don't, uh, but they might have, uh, like Mark said, if they have an agent overseas that that coordinates some of that. Um, you, you don't have an agent in every country, right? Not in every because never not every country requires agents. Right. Right. So remember, there's a third stage to this. That's the visa um, uh, acquisition process if you're overseas. All right. Yeah. One point, just in terms of those the posting of the job, um, one thing is that that job posting, once you have the NOA, is going to be posted on a national job bank by the Department of Labor itself. So when the recruiting process comes, don't be surprised if you start getting calls from people all over the country and people all over the world who access that job site, that, that US DOL job site and see that job offering and they're calling you for those jobs. Um, um, if they call from out of the country, you're not required as part of the recruitment process to even talk to them. If they call from inside the country, you're, you're required to at least discuss it with them potentially offer them the job if they're able, but 
It's up to you if yeah. you want to take a chance on somebody coming across the country and you want to pay for somebody to come across the country to take your job, take the job that you're offering. Right. We'll talk. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, stick with us too. Yeah. Well. Yeah. We'll talk about that in, in, in a moment. Um, all right. So the next few slides. Um, uh, the next two slides, at least, is is the timeline in our office. Okay. And I think it's fairly similar for Mark. We just talked about this. Uh, we file all our prevailing wages for our clients by October first. By November, uh, December first, we want all this information from our clients. We want a payroll summary report. We want to know how many workers and what their season is going to be. We want to know if they want CAP or CAP exempt employees. And we want evidence that um, uh, documentary evidence of how they came up with their payroll report in the name of all recruiters and agents by December 1st. By January 1st, we put the application together so that um, my senior power legal that's working on um, these applications, she's sitting by her computer and God bless her, she's every Every last five years, every January 1st, she's up at midnight. Um, now that it's first to third, she doesn't, she gets up at 5 a.m. as opposed to uh, 12.01 on midnight. Because it used to be that you literally the first applications, the first 33,000 <coughs> applications that were submitted at 12.01 on, uh, on, on, on uh, uh, a minute oh, after midnight, one, yeah. Yeah, after midnight on January 1st, were, were the ones that got the visas, got those cap numbers. So then they, that's when they went to this, you can file within a three day window for April 1st, and they go into this randomization process. Blew up the computer. Yeah, it blew, blew up the computer up twice. Well. Okay. Um, January 1st to 3rd, we filed the applications online. January 4th, they do the uh, randomization A through F. Um, we no, normally know within three or four days after the randomization what category each of your occupations are in, A, B, C, D, or D, F. And again, if you're not assigned an F, maybe an early B, um, you're not going to get cap people, people that need an H to be for the season. All right. Then hopefully throughout the month of February and March, we're filing, we're getting approvals from the Department of Labor and we're going over to USCIS and we're filing with them. Uh, premium processing. Uh, and then they have to get their embassy appointments in April and May. So even though you ask for April 1, very rarely will you ever get them on April 1st. It'll be sometime towards the end of the month of April or, or May. But that's good because most employers on the Cape don't really have an April 1 need, but they want to get part of that cap. So they say they have an April 1 need. Um, and then if they don't show up till you know early May, they're, they're fine because they're not paying them. You don't have to pay them if they're not physically in the US. Yeah. Do you have a question? No. Okay. All right. Uh, slide 10. There's no registration, so we can go over that. All right. Summary payroll report. This is the most important um, graph. This is required by the Department of Labor. This is what U.S. Department of Labor uh, bases your seasonal need and request on. All right. So the left hand side says permanent employment. Okay. So this is going to be for businesses that have that are open year round or and or have a year round need for the position. So let's say you are, um, why can't I remember? Let's put really good time this place right here. Um, uh, Cape the Cape Cod. All right, so Cape Cod is your open year round. On the left hand side, you wanna put down all of your year round employees that are housekeepers, all right? So if this is done for each occupation. So let's just say this is housekeepers. And you're going to put down Billy Catania in January uh, means 10 housekeepers. All right. 10 housekeepers in February. These are, these are people that they actually employed last year. They have payroll documents to back it up. 10 housekeepers worked um, uh, 1,100 hours in their total earnings in January. February, 10 housekeepers, 1,100 hours in their total earnings. March, 10 housekeepers. Total hours work earnings. April, now they now he starts ramping up. 14. Then it goes up to let's say in June and July, he has 60 housekeepers, and then it goes starts going back down. Okay. The left hand side is for your year-round folks. Doesn't matter if they're part-time workers. Okay, doesn't matter what type of visa they're on. If they work for you as a housekeeper in that month. And they're year round employees, they go on the left hand side. Okay, that includes part time employees. 
It includes J1s if they happen to be from, from South America, they're here for the winter. Okay. Everybody that's a year-round employee goes on the left hand side. Okay. The right hand side are for your temporary workers. So let's say the Cape Cotter, they don't have any seasonal workers in January, February, March, or April. Those can be all zeros. But then they hire H2Bs, college kids, J1s, and they start ramping back up. So in April, they hire five temporary seasonal workers. May, they have 10. June, they have 30. July, they have 30. August, they have 40. September, then they start going back down. So the left-hand side is going to be pretty, pretty consistent, right? Because those are the year-round folks that they have. Now, maybe the year-round folks work more hours in the summertime. So it, it, it could vary. But the right hand side is where they get where the Department of Labor is going to analyze your seasonal need. So that it's going to be a bell curve, right? It's going to get fat in the middle if you have a summer seasonal need. It should start in April, all right? It should be when you start first start hiring seasonal workers and should start diminishing in um, October, November, December back to zero. Okay. Does that makes sense. This is per occupation. It doesn't matter what type of worker they are. It's are they working for me year round, even if it's two hours a week, but they're year round they're on the left side. Okay. Seasonal ones are you, you only hire them for a particular period of time. Okay. Um, that goes on the right side. So, what the Department of Labor is going to do is they're going to look at your, your, your payroll summary report and they're going to say you requested um, 50 workers from April 1st to October 30th. Right. And they're going to look at this chart and say, well, does your payroll report? from last year support that, right? Maybe not in January, uh, maybe in, um, uh, in, in July and August, if the peak amount of workers that you had was only 20, they're not gonna approve you for 50, okay? Um, and if you say you need an April 1st start date, but you didn't have a part-time worker, or you didn't have a seasonal worker until June, they're gonna question whether you really need an April 1st start date, all right? Now there's arguments that March often and our office can make, right? Say, listen, last year we didn't have anyone in April, but we need them in April this year because we just went through an entire renovation and uh, we're going to open for the first time on April 15th. So we need them in April, even though a payroll support report shows no housekeepers in April last year, right? So this argument's to be made on the edges. Does that make sense? This year we need, we, we normally don't have a need for November, but this year we have six weddings booked. In, um, in 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 November, and here's you know here's literally copy of you know you can black out the names, but here's our here's our registration, and here's the weddings that we're doing. In November. So that's why we had no housekeepers last year in November, but we need them for this year. So there's some wiggle room, there's some argument, and the Department of Labor is pretty good about that. They really come back and fight us on it. So as long as you give them a legitimate reason why your your, your request doesn't neatly match this payroll summary report. One well, other thing, yeah, well, okay. yeah, yeah. if you're a seasonal business, you will never have anybody on the left side. Okay, so then all your people are temporary, right? So if you literally don't have a need for housekeepers um, in January, uh, in, in November, December, January, February, March, then your entire need for housekeepers is seasonal. So you won't have any year round permanent employees on the left. It's, they're all going to be seasonal workers on the right. Right, U.S. workers, even if they've been coming back for 30 years, they're on the right. They're not, they're permanent in your mind, but for payroll purposes, they're on the right side. All right. Um, the reason one is to reinforce the fact that this should be done per job type, not across your company. Second, um, when you give this documentation, we always require two years. Right, we so, do too. Okay. Um, and so you'll have the payroll summaries in this case for 2020 uh, 2021 to 22 and excuse me, all of 2021 all of 2022 those will be what you're going to submit um number three when matt says about dol being flexible and us being able to make arguments during covid we were able to make significant arguments it's a because of the restrictions and because of the uh, government restrictions on us being able to be open, et cetera, we didn't have the, the year 2020 was not truly reflective of what our need is. So we would put in 2019. 
and show the 2019 payroll summaries. And they bought, they agreed. And they yeah. said, you know, this is not truly reflective. 2019, 2021, those are truly reflective of what is more really your need. And you were able to get your number higher. The third thing, um, and I think the most important is um, you should be doing this now. Right. This is this is the information that we need um, for this, that December first deadline. So if you have a payroll company or if you, you're in charge of the payroll yourself because it's a small operation, you should be working these numbers now. Last, it should be consistent with what your um, 941s reflect. So the bell curve that Matt reflected showing the needs. When you submit your quarter, one of the things that goes in with this, and we'll get to, is your quarterly 941s for two years. You should that those 941s, even though they show all the job titles, should reflect your withholdings on that same curve. So that they so the DOL can say, okay, we see a need here that goes from eight, but you're trying to prove two things to that. What your start date of need is, what your end date of need is, because you can have the H2B workers for up to nine full months if you can prove that that's what your need is. So they're going to look at this, they're going to say, does this prove nine months or the period that you're requesting? Then they're going to look at your 941s and say, are those consistent with holding payments that have been made on payrolls that, that reflect this? Um, and then the last thing, which is really the most important, is um, being aggressive about the information that you supply with them, because we can, we're paid by the word sometimes, we can be, you know, uh, creative in terms of how we argue at the DOL, but that's slowing up the whole process. You don't want to slow up your process. You don't want to give them a reason to question what you're supplying to them. Because if you do, then if you're in group A, you're getting delayed by what they call an NOD, right? It says a notice of deficiency. We need more information on this. You're getting, that's why the Bs are able to jump over the A's sometimes and, and, and get, out, get to these uh, CAT visas that are available because the A's haven't supplied all the information that they need. That to me is the most important thing is Give them what they want. Make sure in your mind it justifies what you're asking for. Um, you know, you can be aggressive, but understand that if you're going to be too aggressive, you might get the red. Yeah, I mean, even a one day delay in the Department of Labor process could be the one day difference in filing under the cap or not under the cap. And every year it happens. Mm -hmm. Every year in our office, there's always one client that's delayed for one day because. They didn't read their email or they're on vacation, they're taking some downtime, they didn't respond to us. With one day delay, they missed the cap by one day. So every day does count. All right. Um, everyone understand that form? Okay. So it's so not only should you have 941s um, uh, supporting that, but though that payroll report should directly come from your payroll for 2021 and 2022. All right, this is just the prevailing wage information. We talked about a lot of this. Um, you have to pay higher than the federal, state, or local minimum wage, right? So the state prevailing wage is going up, uh, uh, minimum wage is going up to 12, or it is at 12, it's going up. 13. 13. All right, so if the dishwasher prevailing wage goes back at, um, at, at $11, you still have to pay 13. All right, so you have to pay whatever's higher. Um, Again, we talked about this multiple work sites. So if you're a paint company, you do 80% of your painting here in the Cape, but you occasionally have a job in Boston, you have gotta put that Boston work site down and they're gonna give you the highest prevailing wage. So you're gonna pay your painters for the entire season on the Cape, uh, the Boston wage. So um, uh, the only way of, uh, to avoid that is to segregate them out and say that these two H2Bs are going to only work in Boston. And, and these are going to only work on the cake. That's the only way you can split that out. Minimum education work experience. Yes, you can technically ask for. I want my dish, I want my housekeepers to have two years of experience. It's just going to cause you nightmares. Okay, um, because one, you have to prove that your dish, that your housekeeper that you bring in has two years worth of experience. Okay, so you have to get letters from the prior employees. It just, it just adds complications to your applications. 
90% of the jobs that we do in public safety marks is no experience necessary will train. Okay. It only causes a problem because it's hard to disqualify US workers that apply, right? Because if it's uh, no experience necessary, will train, and you get five, and you want 10 housekeepers, and five people apply during the winter, and you, you have to either hire them or disqualify them, okay? If you can't, then they're gonna reduce your request from 10 to five, all right? It rarely happens on the Cape, okay? Um, because these, because one, the people that apply in January and February for the job, they don't show up. Um, or they don't respond to you. They say, okay, I see you applied at the front of the website, please contact me for an interview. They don't respond, okay? Um, so, so most of them uh, disqualify themselves. All right, you also have to, on the prevailing wage, um, put in there all deductions for pay. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, the prevailing wage system is normally, it used to be higher than what was actually being paid down here, but the prevailing wage in, in, has, in the last five years has always been less than what employers really have to pay to, to, to hire people on the case. Okay, so the prevailing wage has not been an issue. You can ask for a private wage survey, um, but uh, you're basically blowing up the whole process if you disagree with the Department of Labor's assignment of the prevailing wage. All right, and then all of this material you have to keep for three years because if you're audited, you have to produce it to the US Department of Labor. All right, we go to the next one. Uh, where are we? All right, so this is the actual form that we filed between January 1st and 3rd for April 1st start date. Again, your season may be different, all right? We have plenty of clients that have a May 1st start date. All right, and those folks we don't have to file until February. You can't file until February. All right, um, we just use April one as as a um, as, as as a reference point in these slides. Is we assume that most people are trying to get one of these cap numbers. Um, again, there's a specific window when you can file this. Um, you have to have your state job order. So with that, we're going to talk about that in one second. Um, the employer has to sign the temporary labor certification. And part of that, there's an appendix B, okay? It has, a, shoot, I think it's 36 attestations on it, all right? Read it. This is what you're promising US Department of Labor on a federal application with civil and criminal penalties that you're going to abide by, okay? We're gonna talk about a lot of those obligations and, and liabilities. Um, in, in, in later in the slides, but read the appendix B every year because you're going to say, shoot, I didn't do that last year. All right. Or, oh my gosh, you know, this, I really have to do this uh, moving forward. Yes, because if you're audited, um, you have to prove that you complied with this program. All right. All right. Um, you have to include with this filing of January 1st and 3rd, not only the, the actual temporary labor certification form 9142B, you have to put in there the prevailing wage that you receive and a copy of the order that you're going to put on the state job bank. Plus, you need to disclose all your agents and recruiters that are helping you with this. So if you have somebody in Jamaica, someone in Bulgaria, or someone in Mexico, or someone um, on the ground that are, that, that, that are doing the HR function for you to get people to identify landscapers and cooks, to get them to the... Um, to the uh, U.S. Embassy for the visas to get them on an airplane and a, and a bus. Um, all those agents and recruiters have to be disclosed, okay? And the reason for it is that those folks, those agents, a lot of them are kind of sketchy, okay? And they extort money from the workers to get your job, all right? So if you call an agent and say, listen, I need five dishwashers, and they have to have some experience, and, and the person's in Mexico City, your agent, that agent is going to go to all the neighborhoods and find those 12 dishwashers, but they're going to charge them. Hey, listen, you want to be on this job list? You want to go work on the cave? You're going to pay me 500 bucks and I'll get you on that list. That is prohibited. Okay. You cannot, there, there can be no charges made to the employer, uh, to the employee. Okay. So the employee can't be extorted money. And this is the Department of Labor's way of trying to discover who those bad actors are. And every year there's a list of bad actors and bad agents that extort money from the workers. Okay. You can pay that agent. Say, listen, I'll pay you the $500 per person to identify those workers, but the agent can't charge the employee. All right. 
All right, so all that, we can go to the next slide. All that is, is filed. Just a short little blurb on what the SWA is. Again, it's just a, when you start the recruitment part of this, and when you file a temporary labor certification, um, the goal here by Department of Labor is to identify US workers, okay? So they make you post this job on the state job bank for uh, two weeks. Well, it's actually longer than that. It's for the entire period. It's up to 21 days before your first day of meeting. So if we file in January, you get picked up, you start recruiting on January 15th. This ad for your housekeepers is going to be up on the Massachusetts Department of Labor website up until 21 days before um, April 1st or May 1st or whatever that is, all right? And all US applicants are supposed to use this portal and through the Hyannis um, uh, Career Opportunities Office uh, to be sending you applicants to send you US applicants to, to work, okay? We didn't have one last year. Do we have any um, applicants? Yeah, US applicants through the state. Oh, um, yeah, we always have a couple, but yeah. they don't. You know. I mean, when you, right, they never show when you take a thousand, fifteen hundred positions, and you have right. that one or two. Right. It's a small percentage. Okay. Um, this is just what needs to be in that state job bank. Um, basically, you have to put a full description of the job duties. Um, minimum wage offer, frequency of pay, we can go to slide 16. And then there's some state, then there's some um, language that has to be on, on your state job bank um, job order. Okay. One of them is that you will pay inbound, outbound travel. Right. So this includes, in theory, this includes college kids sitting at University of Colorado that goes online and sees this job and they apply for your position. You have to interview them, we'll train, no, no experience necessary. And they say, yep, I'm gonna work for you. I get there May 1st um, and you pay for your, your Jamaicans to come over. You've got to pay for that college kid from Colorado to come in as well. You got you have to treat American workers the same as you do foreign workers and foreign workers the same as you do US workers. All right, so um, I've never in 25 years really had this happen uh, where a college kid actually goes online and goes to the math department of website, but in theory, it could happen. Okay, so you have somebody in Texas and their itinerant work worker, they're looking to come up to the Cape and they see this job and it says that inbound travel, they can apply for the job and you have to pay for it, but you don't have to pay for it until 50% of the summer uh, they work the season. All right, so that's one of the catches to, to, to avoid people that just want a free trip. Um, and there's other language on here that, that needs to be on there. Now, there's also um, uh, other provisions that you need to disclose if you're providing these benefits to your H2Bs, okay? If there's overtime, you have to disclose if there's overtime available. If you're gonna provide on the job training, you have to state that. If you're gonna provide daily transportation from their work site, you have to disclose that. If you're going to offer some type of limited boarding, lodging uh, facilities, then you have to disclose that, okay? Um, if, you, if they qualify for um, health insurance halfway through the summer, you've got to disqualify that. If we have a lot of employers that they actually, they qualify after two months for their, um, for their uh, retirement savings plan, you have to disclose that, all right? The key here is that Whatever you're going to offer U.S. workers that are temporarily doing this job, you have to offer them to the seasonal worker, H2B. And if you're going to provide special things for the H2B worker, you have to offer them to the U.S. worker. Okay. So the, the, the what the Department of Labor is trying to do is that for all your seasonal um, workers, they all have to be treat, treated equally. No one can be treated better or worse. Okay. All right. Next slide. So this is what a typical uh, uh, job order looks like and what your posting will look like, okay? Um, a lot of this is, is, is required language. Uh, the yellow is required, uh, no, the yellow is, uh, yes, it's, it's all required, really. Um, optional number six, down at the bottom, limited dormitory shared rooms available. So this isn't required, but they're offering it to the each to be workers, so you have to offer it to the US workers. Okay, because the US workers are supposed to be given the notice, a posting notice of this as well. All right, so that the US workers know that they're not being treated unfairly compared to the H2B worker. All right, um, so that's what a typical job order looks like. All right, so then what happens is if you're group A, B, C, D through F, 
Department of Labor, once they get to your application, they pick it up and they tell you, start your recruitment. Tell us, prove to us you can't find a U.S. worker. So it's going to be sometime next spring. You've got 10 days to complete this. Um, you have to start it within 14 days, except the posting notice. Um, it's, it's really confusing because the posting notice, it says you have 10 days to respond, but they want the posting notice on 14 days. The question is, do you have to submit it? And so just understand that you've got to start this right away. If you're an law firm or your agent, that's what needs to be processed for you. Uh, they contact you. You can't delay. Okay. The, uh, the, the certifying officer at the Department of Labor will tell the state to go ahead and activate that job order with the state so they're going to post it on the J uh, state website for 21 days. Um, we don't deal with many uh, businesses that have unions, all right, but let's just say, I don't know if, if, if there's a, uh, one of your businesses actually requires um, union workers that, you know, or, or, or you're controlled by a union shop, um, you have to give notice to the union as well. Right, but they have as much problems finding workers as, as you do. Um, you have to contact all those people that were in the position in the last year. Okay, so if you are a seasonal business or even if you're a peak load business and you um, laid off five housekeepers last year, you have to contact those five workers and ask them to come back. And you have to have proof that you contacted them. Unless Unless they you discharge for right. cause for cause, right? right. right. Let's do a fire, right? But what well, I mean by layoff is yeah. it's it's it was it, it was um an involuntary layoff, not based on cause, okay? Or if they didn't just show up to work, so that you don't have to contact them. So you have to have documentation that you contacted all workers in that occupation last year if it was just a simple the season ending, all right? Or if they resigned, if they, they walked away. Yeah, if they walked away, you don't have to contact them, right? Um, all right, physical posting, you have to physically post this at your work site, and it's going to have all that language in there, okay? That prior slide is going to have all that language of how much you're, you're offering, that you're providing um, uh, daily transportation, if you are, that you're providing housing at $50 a week, if you are. So all that has to be physically posted to give U.S. workers notice. Now, it's, it's a little bit silly if you're a seasonal business and your restaurant's closed, and you Got to go into work and post it, you know, um, uh, uh, on a bulletin board that nobody's going to be at. But that is that's the requirement. It is what it is. In two places. In two places. <laughs> All right. Um, you have to sign it. Okay. Obviously, we talked about the CBA or unions. All right. All this documentation. As you're doing all of this, you have to keep it in an audit file for three years because if you audit it, you have to turn it over to U.S. Department of Labor that you actually perform all of this, all of this recruitment. All right, slide 19. Um, you have to submit what's called a recruitment report at the end of those 10 days that basically says, we did all of this. We had no US applicants or we had one US applicant, we hired them. We hope they show up on April 1st, okay? Um, and it's basically uh, just the attestation stating that, that you complied and tried to find US workers and that you will continue to find US workers up to 21 days before the first person shows up. Then, um, the CO, that's the certifying officer at the Department of Labor, they can certify it, they can partially certify it, they can deny it, they can request more information, or they can make you do directed recruitment where they don't believe that you did any of the recruitment and they'll conduct the recruitment for you. All right. Normally you'll be certified or partially certified. So that's when they'll come back and say, you know what, we really don't think you have a need all the way through November. We're going to cut your, your season short through October. Or we don't believe that you really have a need for 10 workers. We're only going to approve you for eight. Okay, so they do that. Or you asked for 10, but you made an offer to two US workers that apply. So we're only going to approve you for eight. So normally, if, if whoever you're using knows what they're doing, you're going to get it certified. I mean, knock on wood, I think we've had one application in 25 years that was denied our, and I actually think we went that on appeal. So, in, 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 and I'm sure that the track record is the same for mine. So long as you have all the supporting documentation, we're going to get this approved. Might not be the exact season you want, might not be the exact number of people you want, but you can get it approved, okay? And just to follow up on the appeal, you have a right to an appeal. If they say this season is gonna be short or the number is not gonna be, you have a right, a right to an appeal on it, but don't bother. Because by the time you go through that appeal, be your season's gonna be over, you'll be in the next year. So just don't bother. Right. 
Uh, most important part of this slide here is the post certification file. And we're going to talk about that. Um, and if you don't care about your obligations and liabilities by participating in this, the whole second half of this presentation, you don't have to even participate in. Um, but I think it's the most important. Um, because if you are audited in the next three years about this year's program and you fail, um, you can be debarred, which means you cannot participate in the HCB program for up to five years. Um, you can be awarded civil penalties and back wages, not only to your H2B workers, but to also uh, uh, US workers, okay? And if it's really bad, uh, this $250,000 fine in five years in prison. And because immigration is such a hot issue, um, you guys all heard about what happened up in uh, the North Shore of Boston. They literally went in and arrested three owners of this restaurant where they were helping them come in on various types of visas and they made them work in the kitchen to pay off the travel expenses. And that's considered alien smuggling, all right? And it's also considered slavery, which is still against the law, all right? Um, yeah, until they pay off their debt, all right? So uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office will go after employers that if you threaten them, listen, if you don't show up to work on Saturday, I'm gonna have you deported. That is, um, that is a crime. Okay, um, you cannot um, use the threat of deportation or, or kicking them out um, to, uh, you can't use it as a threat at all, all right? That's a crime as an employer, all right? It's considered involuntary servitude, but basically you're forcing that person to work against their will. All right, um, next. What if they quit on you in the middle of the season? Are you obligated to? No, your only obligation is to notify U.S. Department of Labor and USCIS within 48 hours of the that they're no longer employed by you. That's your only obligation. Or if you fire them. Or if you fire them, right. Okay. right. Once employment is terminated, it's prior to the end of the season and they're no longer working for you or they don't show up or you fired them, you have two responsibilities. Known by Department of Labor, known by USCIS in the 48 hours that that employment is ended. Then it's up to them. They stay here illegally or USCIS wants to go after them, that's up to them, but your obligation ends. And that's all you should do. Okay, that's all you should do. All right, obligation of compliance. All right, now we're going to get into the really kind of the ugly stuff about all this. But you know what? Let me come back to that. Why don't we skip up, right? We'll come back to the obligation of compliance and just get through the process part of this. Can we skip up to slide 33 and we'll come back to 21? Go with 33. Uh, 33, yeah. It's page two. It's, it's really towards the end. It's the last five stuff. All right. So, um, we'll actually go back up to 31. I'm sorry, go to 31. All right, so you get this, you have this temporary labor certification in hand. Again, we're starting the process now. Hopefully by mid-February, if you're a group A, you have this labor certification in hand, and it'll say from the US Department of Labor that you, your business, can sponsor H2B workers from this period to this period, how many and at what wage, and with these terms that you've disclosed, right? Then you go to USCIS. Now you go to US immigration and you're going to ask one of two things. You're going to say, hey, these 10 people are sitting in Jamaica. They're subject to the cap. The cap's still available. I want these 10 people to come in from US Embassy Kingston, Jamaica. I want these people to come in from US Embassy Sofia, Bulgaria, Mexico City, Mexico, wherever. Okay. Uh, or your other request would be it should be I have 10 housekeepers that are currently working at Killington. They're going to be in valid status through March 31st. They're going to start for me on April 1st. Here's proof that they're working at Killington. Here's their approval notice for Killington. Here's their pay statements that they're working in Killington. We want them on April 1st to then start working for us. So you can ask one of those two banks, right? Either they're, you, they're outside the country, you're going to bring them in at an embassy, or they're in the country, you want to transfer their H2B status from Killington to your business for the summer, okay? 
Um, with that, you include the temporary labor certification, you include that payroll summary report. And what we do is we also include evidence of the seasonality of the business. So we're gonna submit um, shots of your website. If you're a resort that's open year round, um, we'll, we'll actually take printouts of your, you know, most, most all of you for, 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 uh, uh, that have uh, hotels or inns. They have, you have the online, you know, you can see the months that are crossed out, the days that are crossed out on the, on the, uh, the reserva online reservation system. Um, and then when, when they open up to prove seasonality of your business. So we'll put a, a few extra things in there. There's a letter that we include uh, at both stages that describes your need, describes the job, describes um, what they're going to be doing and what benefits you're going to offer them. All of this is filed with USCIS. If you don't ask for premium processing, your application will be, a, if we file in February or March, your application won't be adjudicated until August. <laughs> okay, so it's called premium processing to ask for a two-week adjudication, and it's optional. Called you, black yeah, it's black. You, you have to pay it, all right? Because that's the only way you're going to have the, um, the, the, the application approved um, in two weeks, all right? Once you have that approval notice in hand, if your folks are outside the country, you give them their approval notice or give it to your agent, and they shepherd your folks into the embassy to get the visa appointments, and they come in. Or you go to, uh, or you can have the approval notices on the bottom, and they're going to say that that John Doe, uh, Carolyn Smith, have, now they have um, approval notices say they can work for you from April first until October thirtieth, and you give that to each of the workers. That's evidence that they can work for you starting on April first or May first, or whenever the start date is. Okay. Um, Let's see here. So that was slide 32. Go up one. So that's all the information that we include. Go to the next slide. This is your only obligation. Okay, so they abscond, they don't show up, they don't show up. Um, you have this much time to notify. And they're, they're, it's really easy. There's a there's a uh, email address with Department of Labor and email address for USCIS. And there's very specific language that we give you. And you just email them and say that this person's employment was terminated on this date. That's your only obligation. And really you shouldn't do anything more than that. You don't need to search them down. You don't have to, you don't have to make sure they got on a plane to leave. Uh, uh, however, if you do terminate them by the end, you're on the hook for paying for their return trip. All right. In most cases, they just disappear. You can't find them. Um, in most cases, they don't want to, to, to leave um, on time, right? So they're not going to come back to you for, for, for uh, the airfare home, all right? But it does happen. In every couple of years, we get somebody that says, you know what? I hate paid five. I don't want to work here anymore. Um, they, uh, they quiet quit at, at work. You fire them, and then you better pay for their trip home, all right? What I suggest in that case is you buy the airplane ticket for them to leave. All right, you arrange for it. Um, not, not say that you're going to reimburse them for their ticket home. They get a first class ticket via via London, you know, uh, <laughs> to go to uh, to go back to Kingston, Jamaica. All right. Um, all right. Then the last stage is the consular process, and really. These are folks that need to get their visas at an embassy, okay? Now, this part is tricky. Like I said, now you've done all of this, right? You started the process now. You have the temporary labor cert in February. You have the, um, uh, uh, you have the USCIS approved. You got it a group A, you got it under the cap. And now you have the last stage. You sent the approval notice out to your agent. They're bringing this person into the US embassy in Kingston, Jamaica. And they're, uh, they waived a lot of these interviews, but they may not continue to waive these interviews. Um, most embassies, you have to, that worker has to show up. They have to articulate where they're going. So what you don't want is the worker to say, I'm going to Cape Cod. <laughs> right? What are you going to do there? I don't know. Who are you going to work for? I don't know. So it's really important that your agent explains that I'm going to work at the Cape Cod as a housekeeper. Here's a copy of, of my job duties. I'm fully aware of what I'm doing, okay? I'm um, gonna earn such and I'm gonna earn X amount of dollars, okay? It's really important that whoever gets them through the embassy process understands 
uh, what they're going to do and communicate that to the worker, right? In fact, you're supposed to give that worker a complete copy of the, the job order so that they know exactly what all the terms are, okay? And that's why that you're supposed to post it at the job site as well, all right? And you're supposed to give notice to all the US workers as they come on board in the summertime that they're also um, have the same terms as the HCV worker, okay? So that's the first part, right? So they have to be able to articulate where, where they're going, what they're going to do, and who they're working for. The second part is a little bit more nuanced, all right? So I'm a full-time immigration attorney, right? All I do, our law firm has been, all we do is immigration law for the last 25 years, all right? You also have to prove non-immigrant intent. So H2B cannot be coming here to live here forever, all right? So during that interview, if they say, I'm getting married to a US citizen in July, they will not be given the visa. If they are a single male or female that has graduated school or never went to school, they have no, uh, no ties in their home country, but they have four uh, US citizen uh, relatives or four green card holders in the US, and they have no ties to return back, they're not going to give them a visa, all right? This happens a lot at, um, at, at uh, the Philippines, the, the, uh, the US Embassy Consulate in Manila, Philippines, um, there's a very high rate of denial, okay? Because a lot of those folks are single, they have no ties to their home country, they have relatives in the United States, US Embassy knows that if we give them this H2B visa, they're never coming back, right? That's their way to legally get into the US, and then they're gonna disappear. This happens a lot in Rio de Janeiro, in the Brazilian um, consulates, um, because we have in this region a very high illegal Brazilian population, right? So they, they have no ties to their home country, or they've not done the H2B program for several years, and they're not coming here, all right? The Jamaicans actually get a break, okay? And the reason is that the, most Jamaicans ultimately go back, okay? Um, so there, a lot of them have a very long history of coming, and leaving, even if it's every three years, but they all go back home, all right? So the Jamaicans, unless they say something really dumb, like I'm marrying somebody in July, um, or they're pregnant and they go in and they say, dad's, you know, in the US, um, they're, the Jamaicans, they usually come up with, all right? But understand, and South Africa has now become a very popular place for uh, US, uh, for Cape Cod businesses, because they have a very big hospitality industry and their season is opposite our season. Right, so right now they're just winding down, um, or they're ramping up their season down there. Right, so South, South African hospitality industry folks are, are, are pretty common, um, uh, brought, being brought here in more numbers uh, for, for next summer. All right, so uh, be aware that they still have to get through this visa process, and it's not easy. All right, especially all these other embassies and consulates. J ones, if you have somebody that's just came here the last three years on the J one program. And they go back home, they're not going to get an H2B visa to come back. Okay. And the reason is J1 program is a uh, the program for college students. So once they've graduated and they've done their three or four year maximum J1 program, if they go back home after the J1, so they work here as a J1 this summer, but all winter long, they do nothing. Right? They don't look, they have an electrical engineering degree from the University of Bulgaria, and they don't look for a job, and they're not doing any work in their home country. And then they're all of a sudden on your petition for H2B for the following season, they're gonna have trouble, all right? Because the chance of them becoming a flight risk in the US is pretty high. So the US Embassy of Consulate will probably deny. It. So if you're doing this H2B program because you want to bring your two J1s back next year, I wouldn't do it because um, it's, 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 it's less than 50% chance of that, all right? Um, so understand that the, that the visa process can be, can be daunting that last stage. And you've spent all your money at that point. You even paid for the visa point, all right. Um, so, uh, so again, that's 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 the that, that's just the reality of this of this visa program. I would also say that it's probably not cost effective if you have one occupation and you have less than 10, 10 people, okay? Because um, at least in our office, I think Mark does it. We basically charge per occupation. You can have as many individuals as you want. Right. So it, the legal work is almost the same for 10 dishwashers as it is to file for 50 dishwashers, okay? Um, 
especially if they're all coming from the embassy overseas. If you're doing, if you're going to spend 10 grand for 10, you can do the math, right? It makes more sense if you're going to do it for 20 or 40 housekeepers in, in dishwashers or, or, or what have you. Okay. So uh, that's another thing to think about. So that's the whole process. Um, I'm going to go into the obligations. I got about 20 minutes to go through the obligations. But let's just stop here for a second. Does anyone have any questions about the process? Yeah. Yeah. So we're amalgamating two businesses. So if we go back to the summary payroll report, do I have to take the payroll from one business and put it into the other one on that store? It depends. So but what type of business are we? The hotel. So we, we just bought the conference center and we're going to Irish village yep. from Yarmouth up into the Irish village. We never had the HTB, just the J1. Right. So what's the best way for us to just go with the previous? Well, how are you going to pay them next year? Are they going to are all your are all your workers going to be paid under a single payroll? Yeah. FBI, yeah. yeah. So then you would combine them. Combine. Right. It really is what you're going to do in the future. Right. So if you have three different companies and now all three companies are all going to be paid, they're going to be essentially one employer for all your dishwashers, no matter which. Uh, well, are you going to move the workers from each uh, each location? So you would have a dishwasher that works at the conference center and also down in Yarmouth. No, we're moving the business from Yarmouth to the conference center. So they're all going to be working at a single location, mm -hmm. and they're all going to be under a single mm -hmm. um, taxpayer ID. One yeah. company. Yeah. So then you would want to, for your historical mm -hmm. payroll summary report, you want to combine all. Okay. Are they going to be two separate businesses? Or is it only going to be one business? Just uh, one business. Okay, so you can't buy multiple. I mean, I'm not just right. So. right. Yeah, you want to you want to consolidate that. Yeah. My problem, I guess, is that uh, when we work out restaurant, we hire them to be a prep, like food prep, and then if they're any good, we bring them to the front line. But it's hard to bring them to the to bring them into the to the front of the prior age of cooking. If they're uh, they're not up to the task, it gets pretty busy. So well this so so there was a um, a news bulletin put out. So if you're investigated, all right, and, and most of your investigations are going to be started by either a competitor or by one of your disgruntled employees, probably a US citizen, or the H2B themselves. All right. So so that's going to be the source of all your investigations. Um, and it's just like it's, 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 it's like every other wage and hour, the Department of Labor wage and hour division are the ones that enforce 90% of this, right? 99% of this, okay? Even USCIS has deferred investigatory powers to the Department of Labor wage and hour. There was a, um, there was a, the, my national association has, um, has quarterly meetings with wage and hour. And they said the biggest violation they see in the HTB process is that employers put this, Put their workers in positions they're not supposed to be working. Okay, so that's exactly it. So you bring somebody in as a dishwasher, and then you have them doing line cook duties, and then they eventually become a short order cook. Or you bring somebody as a as a, a short order cook, and now they're the sous chef, right? Which is what happens in restaurants. I get it, right? Um, I had a company that brought in lifeguards. And every once in a while, the, the lifeguard had to be a pool attendant. So they had to make sure that kids were old enough and tall enough, they had parents and they had to log them in, right? They were fine because they we didn't say that they were also pool attendants, which is a different occupation than a lifeguard, okay? So they had to pay back wages because pool attendants got more than lifeguards at that particular time. So they had to pay back wages to all of them because they performed uh, uh, they performed um, yeah. uh, pool attendant duties. Mm -hmm. So the risk you run by doing that is that if you're investigated, they will say that you brought this person in as a um, as, as, mm -hmm. as a uh, dishwasher and you pay them sixteen dollars an hour, but you have them perform uh, job duties as a cook that the prevailing wage is eighteen dollars. Not only do you have to pay that person eighteen dollars, then you now you poisoned your cooks. So technically, all U.S. cooks that were making $16 an hour, you have to now pay them $18 an hour as well, okay? 
but you can mitigate that a little bit by if so if they came in as a dishwasher right. and went to the line crew, if you adjusted their salary so that all the line you were paying the line cook's position, then if you ever got yeah, you can mitigate it, but but that's the biggest violation they see is that they're putting people in positions that they're in, in doing job duties that they're not required to do. But the problem with that is, the, I mean, the solution to that is have a very broad job description, right? Say, I want a general kitchen work. They're gonna do dishwashing, they're gonna need to do prep cook, and they may work the line. But then the problem is, the US Department of Labor will pick the highest occupation job duty that they're doing correlated to the highest occupation and you have to pay all your age to use that. So now you may end up paying a dishwasher $20 a, a year uh, for the wow. entire season, an hour for the entire season, right? So the problem with being too broad is that you're going to get stuck with a higher wage, you're going to be overpaid. And in, in technically, all the Department of Labor can't enforce it, the law requires you to treat all other workers the same. Yeah. And if you bring an H2B worker, and let's say you're not filing for cooks at all, <clears throat> Right, you only have American staff or cooks, but you have dishwashers that are H2Bs. Once one H2B dishwasher performs cooking duties, now you've brought all your cooks into the H2B program. You didn't need to do it because you have to treat how you have to pay that H2B worker the prevailing wage for a cook, and you have to comply and you have to pay, treat all American cooks at the same wage. But you don't have to pay the uh, H2Bs that are still doing prep work. As much as the uh, you're paying the, the uh, line books? That's a good question. All right. So the question uh, is, you can you can pay people different wages, okay? Obviously, you can't base it on your citizenship, your color, your religion, right? You can't do it on the obvious things. Um, but you have to disclose that in your application. So if you're going to have a range, say, listen, we pay. Um, up to 20% more for people with more experience. <coughs> That's fine, but you have to disclose it in your uh, initial um, um, job offer. All right. So that's just one of those things that, that, that you've got to treat everybody the same. That's 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 really that's the big issue. Can we just this is the important I think for people. Um, an audit, not an audit. This is separate from an audit. Just an investigation periodically. Um, DOL or USCS, primarily DOL, um, will take a section of the country, different areas. Because remember, this is these 66,000 visas are for the entire country, and they're for the entire a, a panoply of job in, in industries rather that apply for these jobs. It's not just hospitality, like it would be on k It's not just restaurants. It's not just landscapes. It's forestry. It's shrimping. It's crabbing shipping. And, and shipping. It's, it's everything. So you're competing with all, all these other industries um, uh, for these 66,000. So typically, this would be what we call in the vernacular a raid or an investigation. They'll take a, a Nantucket, for example, or Cape Cod, for example, or Martha's Vineyard, for example. They'll take two investigators. They'll send them there for one week. They'll give them a list of uh, employers. It might be 10, it might be 20. They'll say, you have to go investigate this employer. These, this person sought and secured H2B workers. They come to your premises. They usually come knocking at the, they, they don't come on now, so call, they'll say, hey, we're coming. We'll see you there at 8 30. They come to the restaurant, they say, We want to see all your paperwork. So the first thing you have to do is you lay open all your files. They want to make sure you have all the 797 form approval notices. They want to make sure they have, you have all the, the, payroll the payroll documents. So then they'll say, Okay, what job type? They'll say, They'll see which job titles you hired Joe Smith for. Joe Smith was brought in as a dishwasher. Okay, all his paperwork's in order. Next thing we'll do is let's see the restaurant. What do you mean? Oh, there it is, right there. That's the restaurant. Okay. And they're taking pictures, they're making notes because they have to do a report. And they do this all in a week for 10, 20, whatever, however many that they give. Yeah, they did this two years ago. Right. And that's usually kind of a cycle. I and mean, was, I think, three or four years ago. So it's kind of a cycle. And we might be coming up to it. You never know. But the, um, the, the biggest problem with the audience, they want to talk to the worker. Right. That's the next thing. So now they go to the worker. They want to say, I want to talk to Joe Smith. What do you do? 
And, and Joe yeah. Smith says, great, what do you do? How much are you being paid? If Joe Smith comes in and says, well, I'm a line cook. Well, you were hired as a dishwasher. How much are you getting paid? You can, you can write the check because at that point you have. And then the last thing is they take the picture. They take a picture of the employee. The employee says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I, I, I don't want my picture taken. I don't know where this is going. Well, they have to match up the picture of the employee to the picture of the passport and the visa to make sure we're talking about the same Joe Smith. Um, so that's just happen the, often. And most employers can comply with right. this. But, but it's not a, this is not a, fuzzy group of workers that you can do whatever you want with them. That's the bottom line, right? Yeah, it's very specific and all of it is to protect US workers, right? Now, Department of Labor, this is not a business program. They don't care what your need is. They don't care that you can't open the door. They're just here to regulate and protect US workers. That's all Department of Labor cares about. I get calls all the time from just irate businessmen, businessmen and women that complain that they can't find labor, they can't keep, they keep people, they can't open their doors, and the H2B program, they're fighting them on it. Department of Labor doesn't care about your business. All they care about is if you're gonna bring foreign people in, uh, foreign workers in for a seasonal term, we're protecting US workers, first and foremost. But there are none, you say, right? But it doesn't matter. Um, they're saying, why aren't you offering $25? A, they want you to, to, to pay uh, approximately $50 an hour, because that helps US workers. Their sole mission is to protect US workers. So they don't care about your business or business needs. They sympathize, but that's not their job. Okay. And every spring we have a seminar here about wage an hour, and we bring the two, the two ladies that run the wage an hour um, division for Southeast Massachusetts. And my partners here, and they talk about FLSA and all the employment laws that they've got to comply with. Um, they're sympathetic. But they'll be the first to tell you it's not their job to worry about your business. Their job is to worry about American workers and you're treating American workers um, safely, that they're getting the first opportunity at these jobs and they're being treated the same as foreign workers. The USCIS is concerned is that you're treating with foreign workers and you're not taking advantage of them either, right? By paying them $3 an hour, like threatening, you know, if they don't do overtime at the regular rate of being deported. So that's not good. Enough. Yes. Um, so the situation you originally described in the beginning where potentially there's a worker that already has H2B, they're in Killington. Yep. They want to flip-flop back and forth yep. in Killington and Cape Cod. Does the employer still have to go through this same process that we described? Like yep. file by all those deadlines. Yep. Are those and are those flip-floppers part of the 33,000? No, that's what I was saying. Those are cap exempt. They're, okay, so so they so they even if they have all the thirty three thousand, the next batch that comes out, say you you miss out on that, right? But you still could get one of these flip floppers. However, you still have to go through this whole file. the entire process. process. Okay, yep. with the exception of they don't have to do the embassy thing. Normally, they normally they don't because they're already here. Okay. So if you're that worker, if you're a worker and you're brought in from overseas on last year's H2B cap, mm -hmm. right? So Killington brought them over last year. They're allowed to stay so long as they're continuously in H2B status for up to three years. Okay. So it can be as many different employers as they get to sponsor them for up to three years. So those people do not, every time they switch employers, they don't have to get a cap number. Okay. Because they got one. And that cap number is good for three years for that individual worker. Okay. And the next question is, how do you find these people? That's the hardest that part. That would this. like to engage in this. That's the hard. Thing. That's the hard, and they're exempt from the cap, right? Because they call it, right? That's the hardest part of this process, and that's what I was trying to say at the beginning. Is that the ones that are successful in this are, um, unfortunately, are are, long, are are large resorts that have huge HR networks, so it's easy for. Uh, you know, Ocean Edge with a thousand employees to call Killington that have a thousand employees and, and, and have some type of arrangement that they may have had for 20 years, right? Where they're, if they get H2Bs, they send them down for the summer. And if Ocean Edge gets a few cap H2Bs, they send them up there because they want to bring them back for, you know, for up to three years, they can do this location. But that's the hardest part. Two points. One is to reinforce that every year, both Killington and your example has to do it. 
So each and every year, because each and every year you're, you're getting certified by the Department of Labor that you have a need for these temporary workers, right? And then um, uh, there is a website that uh, is part of the Department of Labor's website. They have a list, and I don't want to discourage you, but they have a site where you can go and it will break down state by state every employer that applied for, not necessarily received, H2B workers. Um, and so I always tell my employers, the best thing they can do is get a working relationship with another company that's on the opposite season that you are. If you go on that website, you will find the state of Florida and it will be a single page, a, a single lines, 10 pages of single lines of employers that sought or potentially obtained H2B. And I, I think, you know, it's kind of dialing for dollars. You could dial up, take the biggest resorts, maybe work down the way to the smallest resorts or smallest restaurants. Um, if you have a working relationship, if you, you know, go in the off season, if you go to Florida or, or Colorado or, you know, someplace that has the opposite season you do, and you build up and talk to the people that have different restaurants or businesses there and say, hey, you know, how do you get your help? Do you use H2Bs? We use H2Bs, you know, and build up a relationship and a working relationship. And there's companies out there that are agents, the U.S. companies out there um, that just do this type of matching for you. Obviously, you got to pay a fee, right? right? But you can call them and say, listen, I'm looking for a five in country cap exempt dishwashers for next year. They have to have X amount of experience doing X, Y, and Z. Um, can you find them? And they'll find them for you. Okay. But that's the that's the hardest part about this process, I think. Yes. So not to put either of you or both of you on the spot, but in in what situation, right? So you're a Massachusetts lawyer, Massachusetts law firm, and I'm guessing Antioch is doing things in different states. When is it appropriate to use the law firm versus the consultant? Or is it six and one half dozen of the other? It's just a comfort level, right? Because a lot of these consulting, these HR firms that do the match, they'll offer the legal services, right? So immigration law is a, so long as you're a, 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 you are a member of a state bar, you're allowed to practice immigration law anywhere. So I can do, immigration law for a company in California. I do, I have clients in California, I have clients just about every state. Um, and I can do immigration law because immigration law is a federal application. So as long as you're a member of the bar. So the question really is, do you want a lawyer involved in the process or uh, are you comfortable just having a, one of these HR agencies that just specialize in h 2 do it themselves? Um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, my stuff's overkill, right? So I, we didn't even talk about uh, 12 slides, right? That are just obligation and enforcement and liability stuff. We're not gonna get to it, but they're all in here, right? And you really only need to know if you're gonna do it. <laughs> um, so that's my, I mean, that's, I, it's, I feel that it's my obligation as an attorney to tell my clients all their obligations and their risks and their liabilities, all right? And what they have to do on a yearly basis. I don't know if those HR companies that I've never dealt with them provide that type of information to you. They just show you the process and we'll take care of it. Just sign here, sign here, right? So that's, it's really your comfort level, how you run your business. I'm an attorney, I'm a practicing attorney. I, I have as well. Oh, okay, so, so okay, it's full, full disclosure. So the question really, I think becomes the following. Um, now that you've at least had a taste of what's involved in this whole process, are you comfortable with an attorney interpreting this and, and making sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed? Or not? Um, I think it, it has gotten to this level over 20 years, where it's almost a necessity in terms of having an attorney, if you will, um, interpret and advise you on the steps in the process and and have you go along. Um, not it's not necessary. People can do it themselves. They can try it themselves. Um, we have clients from Michigan to Florida. And almost every night, almost, and many states in between. Um, and, you know, it, it's just a matter of, okay, what's, do you think you get the best advice? Are, are, you, are you happy with the results? Are you getting prompt service? 
you know, in one manner or another, we're almost like McDonald's, you know, you order something and we try and deliver. It used to be when I first started off in this business, it, it used to be back in 2002, um, that most of the H2B work was done by the business owner themselves. The process was much simpler. Um, and uh, especially bed and breakfasts and, um, and, and small inns and small restaurants, um, I'd say 90% of the H2B process was done by the business owner. Right. They had done it for 10 years in a row. They knew all the people at the Department of Labor. They knew how to figure out the form. Form was two pages, right? Uh, and, and they knew how to file the USCIS and these structures. But every seems like every five to seven years, they've made the process more difficult, more difficult, more difficult. Whereas now, I think, I don't know, I think it's impossible to do without an attorney. Uh, I've tried, as I said, uh, I've applied for H2Bs. I've gotten H2B years ago, said, but I haven't recently because we don't open until the end of May. And it's just been, I thought, well, I heard today, maybe I misunderstood you, that uh, if you don't hire until the May, you get your, you know, you're going to a slim chance of getting that first. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, that's why I'm saying this program really works if you can identify those people that are already here, they have time remaining of it three years, and they want to transfer to you at the end of their winter season. That's good. Is it, is it best to identify them first before going through this process? Because I'm understanding that like you can go ahead and do it and go do the process and you shell out all the money and congratulations. You got approved, but then you can't find anyone. You're all that money. I, you spent ideally, yes. Practically impossible. Okay. Because um, most of the my clients, they go down and they start looking for the used to be workers for next summer in January. Okay. So they'll go to the resource that they have relationships with, and they'll do their interviews for next summer during January and February. Okay. Um, a little practical advice. I, I, you know. It hurts us too to go through all this process and not see our clients prevail getting something. So we really kind of take that personal. And we try and help as much as we can, but we're not a, a human resource agency. We can't, can't be, can't wear all the hats. So you know, as far as we're concerned, if we do the process right and we and get everybody approved, then, then we've done what we were hired for. We go, we try and go the extra yard really with my staff and, and say, okay, how can we help the employer? I always tell the employer is the same thing, a little practical advice. Let's say, uh, first of all, two things. First, you should have a plan A and a plan B. Plan A is I'm going to, I'm going in with this. I'm going to try and get the out of country workers that I think will really help me. And if I get in, if I win the uh, lottery in terms of being uh, computer generated lottery, and I get into group A, great, I'm going to go that route. Come January 4th, 5th, 7th, 14th, whatever, when, you, when the groups come out, if I'm not in group A or group B even, um, I, I know I'm dead in the water in terms of getting somebody from out of the country. So my plan B is I'm going to work from December 1st on to try and find the what we call extension workers. They're the ones that are, you call them flip floppers, they're called extensions, they go back and forth. Um, I get a, a list, an A list and a B list. Even if I, let's say I got all my extensions in de December and January, all the people I said, hey, these are great extensions, they're going to come up from Florida, they're going to come now. Florida is taking a big hit. This hurricane is it's going to have some real impact. There's a lot of our employers and employees who won't have workers that are going down there. Now they have no place to go to. Um, and they've gotten approvals to extend that. So you're going to have these workers that were going to go there and now can't go there. So that kind of helps out some of the other winter employers. But anyway, and potentially is going to help out some of the summer employers next year. But so now you have this list of extension workers. You say, okay, I've, I've got all these people that I, I'm going to bring. Now you get into group A. Now you, you have the best of both worlds. You can create a real A team. You can say, all right, look, I'm going to take 
Joe, Sally, and Tom from out of country, who I really, really wanted in the first place. And I'm going to take um, Dick, Jane, and Spot from uh, the group B uh, as uh, the extension workers. And I'm going to create my A team. Great. Now you have some of these other extension workers that you were going to bring that you don't have enough room for. Guess what? I can find them work. You, the, all these employers in the room can find work for them. All you have to do is network a little bit and say, hey, look, you know, I had this person. He's really good. She's really good, really talented. I was going to bring them. I don't need them now. Can you, can you help out? Can you do something? All right. That's number one. Number two, um, when you create the A, the A list, you know, the plan A and the plan B, follow through on it. You're going to start early. I'm, I'm telling you right now, we're getting, we get calls now for people who are trying to extend to winter job. It's too late. We were getting calls in July from people who were in summer jobs looking for, their, looking for winter jobs. We, uh, you know, you just have to, you have to work it. And, and if you're committed to doing it, it'll work. We have one quick question oh. from the online group. Um, can you indicate a preference for where the workers will come from or is it random? No, it's where do you find them? Well, there are 50, 50 to 55 oh, yeah, right, right, right. right. There's certain countries that you cannot bring people in from. Every year, the State Department produces a list of about 50 or 52 yeah, yeah, yeah. that says um, these are the countries that they can come from. Everybody else can't bring them from Iran, can't bring them from Russia. Proper, some reason Antigua. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, yes. I have two questions. Um, one would be: Have you figured out the cost per hire? It, it depends on how many people you put on an application. Okay. Right. That's that's really what it is. It's um, you know legal fees. Let's just say it's ten thousand dollars, but you bring in one worker, ten thousand dollars. Okay. If, but if it's ten housekeepers. Right, and it's a thousand dollars per house. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't really make sense from a dollar perspective um, unless you're doing a, a, a number of them. And then you mentioned earlier in the presentation that if housing was provided, you have to disclose it. But is housing mandatory? No. And neither is transportation when they're here from where they're staying to where they're going. Correct. Right. Very few things are mandatory other than you have to pay the prevailing wage. You have to pay for their inbound transportation costs. Um, you have to pay for their visa fees, and you have to disclose everything to them. But does it create a bigger challenge of housing if you don't have to? Correct. As a practical, as a practical um, uh, uh, factor on the cake is if you don't at least arrange for them to have housing, they're not coming. I, I always tell people two things. Number one, you, they can't come and live in a tank. So you either have to provide housing for them or coordinate with someone else to make you know, find housing for them. You don't have to obligate yourself financially necessarily. They're obligated on it. If you provide housing, you're able to charge them a reasonable rent um, on a weekly basis uh, to compensate. So. so that's a really good question. Right? So there's very few things that you have to provide. The problem is that if you do provide them, you have to disclose it so that you're offering it to U.S. workers as well. Okay? So that's, that's, that's a very critical point. But yes, a practical matter, if you can't provide housing or or at least coordinate housing for them, they're not coming. And daily transportation is becoming a bigger, bigger issue too. You know, how many need to work every day? If you put me in a place for $50 a week in Yarmouth, but you're in you're in Dennis uh, or you're in Chatham, you know, how are you gonna get me to work every day? Um, you don't have to provide it, but it's just a practical logistical issue. Um, just one follow-up when you said uh, asked the question of uh, how do you find them? I also tell them my employers this. Um, the best advocate that you have for your business is that H2B employer because he's gonna, he or she is now gonna go on to Florida or, or Colorado or whatever. They're gonna go to their winter job and they're gonna work with other H2B employers, either from the same country, different countries, or whatever. They're gonna learn different skills. But when they go there, you want them to say, hey, you know what? Working on Cape Cod was the greatest summer I ever had. And this employer that I was working for is a really great employee, employer rather. And what I want 
uh, when I then you say to that employee, that the H two B employee that you have, look at when you go to Colorado, when you go to Florida, you know the operation that we do here. You know the volume that we do here. You know the skill sets that are required to work in this position. Help me find somebody. So they're going to go to that other job in the winter, and they're going to hang with other H two B workers, and they're going to. You know, socialize with them and everything else, and whether they're in the same restaurant that they work in there or some other place. And they're going to say, you know what? How'd you like to come to Cape Cod for, and work for the summer? My employer that I worked for was a really, really good employer, and I got all the hours I wanted. They paid me well. They treated me like you know a nice person and a human being that I am. And and um, because all of those extension workers around the country, they can pick and choose where they want to work. They don't, they, and believe me, they do. They're going to say yes to you. And while they say yes to you, they might be looking for something else. They find something else, they're going to leave you in a heartbeat. But if they have an advocate for them, and, and it works on the other end too, because um, yeah. uh, when when they come here, they know that the, 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 the worker that brought them here and said it was such a great thing, they're going to make sure that they do a good job on both ends. So I think uh, the conference room is used up. Um, just a, a, the last note is that uh, up there is, is Mark and his business, um, and not mine and my business. Um, but I, uh, I think they're I think they're still accepting clients um, moving forward. Our office is not. All right, so we're, we're not accepting any new clients for next season at this point. What are you doing here? Uh, I've been doing the presentation for 20 years, 20, more than 20 years. Thank you. I'll do it out of the goodness of my heart. All right.